Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello and welcome to Asia Tech Podcast Stories with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. We feature the most interesting stories and voices from entrepreneurs and investors behind the world's most dynamic tech startup ecosystem. It's called Asia. To join us today to do this, we're recognized as one of Asia's most influential digital marketers by CMO Asia Magazine, featured in Campaign Asia's 40 Under 40 honors list he's developed brand strategies for well you name it but names like unilever google coke nestle diageo he's an author music producer the go-to guy for anyone who wants to know anything about what's hot in asia and digital today founder of kepios and global consultant for we are social asia it's simon kemp everybody welcome to the show thank you thanks for having me as well Great to have you here. I mean, kicking off this series of Asia Tech Podcast stories, we're all about stories of technology in Asia, why people have chosen to come to Asia, and what's going on in Asia right now, both in digital, mobile, internet, and so on. So it's great to have you here, because you are the man. You are, I mean, if anybody's ever seen what Simon publishes, I mean, you just got to go and check out his LinkedIn profile and what he publishes on SlideShare. It's phenomenal. These presentations that you're publishing Simon you have a, an amazing work rate I mean just looking at, down at what you've published in the last six months there's the social selling guide uh, marketing machines why algorithms are our destiny the digital essentials for Southeast Asia 2017 and that's just in the last two or three months and it goes on right you you're a busy man yeah I like to put out a lot of content out there I like the conversations that go with it as well so hopefully that's very relevant to uh, this particular podcast conversation. But yeah, it's um, something that I really enjoy doing and I've been fortunate enough to meet lots of people as a result of putting that out. So uh, that inspires me to keep doing it. Fantastic. We're going to drill down a bit into those presentations and some of the insights that you can share with us on what's going on in Asia right now, what you've discovered. Yeah. But first, let's back up a little bit. You're not from Asia. The accent kind of gives it away. Tell us a little bit about where you're from. <laughs> So I, uh, I was born in Edinburgh, in Scotland. And suddenly the accent will come through when I start talking about <laughs> Scotland. Um, so yeah, I spent my first 18 years in Edinburgh, um, but I always had a love for languages and foreign cultures. Um, so I went off and spent some time in Europe as part of my studies when I was at university. Um, went back to the UK for five years after I graduated, uh, worked at Accenture to start with, doing uh, lots of hardcore Java stuff, so some programming to start my career, and then moved into marketing strategy and uh, had a, a fantastic job in London, but most of the work that we did was dotted around the world, and a big part of that work was in Asia, so that was how I got introduced to this part of the world. Uh, fell in love with the people, with the food, with the whole sort of culture of Asia, and just the, the pace of progress out here, mm. so moved initially to Bangkok in 2007, so yeah, 10 years ago, uh, and then shortly after that moved to Singapore, and I've been in Singapore, it will be 10 years next week. Congratulations. That's Thank fantastic. You. I love that story that you say that you fell in love with the food and the culture and everything here. This is something that's sort of a common theme with all, all of us, right? Us three here. I just want to find the thread here. It's like, you must have friends who come out to Asia, friends from Edinburgh, Back home. As, <laughs> uh -huh. as much as Michael does friends from America and mine from the UK as well, people come out to Asia and are they sort of constantly surprised by things? Do you ever f sort of find that people, you know, it sort of breaks their expectations of what's really going on out there? Is there anything that's a common thread in those conversations? Yeah, I think everybody's surprised. I, mean, I confess I was I was probably the most surprised of anybody. Um, I, I liked to think that I was fairly worldly wise in my very sort of arrogant late teens, um, sort of traveling around Europe and thinking that I was very open minded. But when I first was told by my boss that I needed to go to Jakarta to do a workshop, Mm. I freaked out and I was like, oh my God, I have to go and get all these injections. <laughs> and all, all, my, all my colleagues laughed at me and they were saying, you're going to go and stay in a five-star hotel in Jakarta. You don't need injections. But I was insistent <laughs> because I was a very safe-minded kind of kid back then. Um, so I went off and I got all these immunizations against all these like ridiculous diseases that nobody had ever heard of because I was very sort of hypochondriac like that. And then I got to Indonesia and I went and stayed, at, I think it was the, the Mulia or the Melia. I can't remember what the exact name of the hotel was in Jakarta. It was absolutely amazing. It was a beautiful hotel. Um, 
And you just, it's, it's really interesting because you end up contrasting almost, I'm not going to call it propaganda, but the, sort of mm. the image of Asia that you grow up with in a sheltered life like in Scotland, um, what you in, imagine Asia is versus what it's like when you get here. And it was just such a shock for positive reasons. I couldn't believe it. So a few weeks later when my boss said, we're going to send you to Bangkok, I sort of embraced that one. And I confess, I, I remember even as we were taxiing after just landing, on, on the tarmac at the airport and looking out and seeing the palm trees and the warmth. If anybody's ever been to Edinburgh, you'll know it's a beautiful. It's cold <laughs> and grey. Yeah. So this, this sort of landing in Bangkok, Bangkok and this beautiful tropical scene awaiting. And then when I started meeting the people there, like, yeah, that was it. I was, I was hooked. Wow. So, Michael, you've lived in Bangkok, what, for five, six years now? Six years. Six yeah, years. I'm, I mean, and I've been coming. I've been coming to Bangkok before I moved here for fifteen or so years, ba- out of my base in Tokyo. Um, and I, I remember landing at the old, you know, DMK at Damwang Airport, and just thinking, "Wow, this whatever this is, this is amazing." Right. That yeah. feeling, because you know, my family is from the northeast of the United States as well, and I was coming from Tokyo, so someplace that gets cold, we do see zero degrees and we do see snow, and to land in a place that just had you know, what I would call perfect vacation style heat was interesting <laughs> to me. And it made me come back and then it actually made me come and live here as well. Mm. You, you get that when your friends come out as well, or people that you've known for some time who haven't really experienced Asia when they come out. Do they, I mean, there's that sort of, yeah, there's a little bit of excitement associated, but are they sort of surprised by how well developed things are? I mean, especially, I suppose, in Singapore, Simon, it's like, you know. yeah. I remember the first time my parents came out, so they'd never been to Asia before. Um, and then they came out to Singapore, I think it was just in time for the first Grand Prix here. So my dad's a big Grand Prix fan. Um, so you know, he had a very good motivation to come and see me at that specific time. And I remember, sort of, you know, they had a little bit of, I suppose, trepidation, the same as I did. They kind of imagined Asia would be a certain way. And the very first day that we got here, they got off the plane um, in Singapore, arrived about five o'clock in the evening and I thought the best way to sort of introduce them to what Singapore was like was to take them to a hawker centre. Right. Um, I chose I chose where I live in Singapore based on the location of a hawker centre. So um, I took them across the road to the hawker centre up in Coven where I live um, in Singapore and I think my dad, it, you could see this change in his face when he sat down with a, a sort of bottle of very cold tiger beer and a large plate of chicken rice and that was him set so every time he comes out like he talks for about a month before he comes and how he's looking forward to going and sitting in the hall and yeah, I think it's, it's the same for almost every friend that's come out you know they sort of had these visions of what asia would be like and then they get to singapore and realize it's probably right. one of the most technologically advanced safest cleanest cities in the world it sort of shocks people for sure are you, are you sort of into that sort of street food scene because i know a lot of people when they go to asia they'll sort of avoid that because of all the things that you said maybe you know i want to get typhoid or whatever it is right yeah I, that, that was my initial thought as well as like, i'm only going to eat in five star hotels and right. i had a, a colleague who is she was very adventurous when it came to food um she took me out to some of the best street food in bangkok and that was me i was just again completely hooked um right. and that actually ended up motivating where i ended up living both in bangkok and in the eventual move to Singapore. Um, so the, the whole street food scene in Asia is just so amazing. Oh. Obviously, with the weather for it, which makes life a bit easier. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You can't, I mean, it's, it's like nowhere else, isn't it? And I think as well, it's, it's sort of a mindset, isn't it? Is that you, do you go and eat with the locals or do you behave like a tourist and stay in the hotel? And I think that's kind of a mindset you can take into business as well, isn't it? Do you get Definitely. out there? Do you sort of, you know, mix at the front line or do you sort of view the world from on your perch, you know, behind the computer screen as well? Yeah. yeah I'm, sorry. I was, sorry, Simon. I was going to say, I think Graham brings up a really good point, right? So you have this deeply embedded knowledge, right, of how social, how people use social in Asia. And I think it's actually really different, frankly, from the way it is in the United States um, and also in Europe, right? So you see the, and it's not even the rise anymore, but sort of the, um, <clears throat> the ubiquity of something like WeChat and how yeah. it's completely used differently, you know, not just in China, but in the whole region and line um, completely yeah. used differently than the way people use WhatsApp or even um, Messenger on Facebook, which has a mm. billion people on it, but still doesn't seem to have had sort of the overriding impact from a day-to-day sort of transactional perspective that WeChat has. And I'm just wondering, like, for you and, and for me as well, and I think Graham's the same way, right? But I always believe if you don't understand the local culture, you're never going to be able to, to succeed in the local business because 
the business. It's really three things for me that, that make up like local. And that's the language. So you really need to understand the subtlety of the language, uh-huh. the food, right? So going to a hawker is more, it's more than just fun. It's really learning about mm-hmm. what, are, what are regular people do yeah. who are using technology every single day. How do they eat? How do they interact? What are they talking about? Are they taking photos? That type of thing. Right. And then also business. So how does all how do all those three things fit together? And that to me is actually really interesting, particularly for someone from Edinburgh who <laughs> now lives in Asia. Right. So yeah. I'm just wondering like how you use all those things together to, to do what you do and understand better, you know, the, the tech that you use and that you talk about in the context of the life that you live. Yeah, you, you've absolutely nailed it. The culture is essential to what people use, how they use it, the value that comes out of that usage. And I think much as if you've ever seen any of the stuff I publish on Slideshow, you'll know I'm an absolute addict for numbers. So I produce yeah. thousands yep. of slides of data every year. But in all honesty, that is a start point. But the numbers don't tell you the story. No. They're almost like they're the scene mm. that you're creating, but you then got to put the plot on top of that. So going to a hawker center, riding public transport and just, you know, slightly creepily peering over people's shoulders to see what they're using. <laughs> um, it, it's the most important part of being able to actually build the engagement, which makes social media valuable. Obviously, you can reach lots and lots of people on social media, but if you're not building something that speaks to their needs and speaks to the context in which they use those platforms and devices, it's just going to be another irritation in their lives and they'll quite easily ignore it. Um, so I think it's it's that essential, but every time I go to a different city around Asia, the, one of the first things I want to do is just go out and see what people are doing, you know, that often is just a case of going and sitting in some street food outlet and watching people taking, you know, it, it's funny. Everywhere you go, people take pictures of their food. Right. Um, food is such an essential part of everybody's everyday life. But it's just watching how they do that, what they do it with, what platforms it's for, even those subtle nuances. So you go out to a hawker center in the business district in Singapore and Instagram is the device of choice. Um, you're taking, you know, these very crafted pictures of your lunch. Whereas once you get out into different parts of Asia, then that becomes quite a different story Um, and when you get down into things like the messenger apps that you talked about obviously you've got something like wechat in china which is the internet in an app the funny thing is if you've used wechat outside of mainland china you probably haven't seen what it's like because the wechat that we have outside of china in english is a a, a very very pale imitation because it's the same company it's a a shell right it's a shell of itself that because in china and again, you know this better than I do, and I'd love to hear you talk about this a little bit too, right? But it is your daily interaction with the rest of the world. So you pay for things with WeChat. You, yep. you meet people on WeChat. And, and, and I mean, you help organize your meetings. I'll be there at 7. Yep. Everybody shows up. I'll take care of this bill. You pay for it. You can split the bill. There's so, And you can order taxis. So I believe that they have a partnership, or one of the chat mechanisms has a partnership with Didi as well. Yep. It's just interesting to see. And the other thing... I, I would find really interesting is do you see a blur, right? Because, and I see this in my own life, but I'm curious about yours. Do you see a blur between things you do that you're personally interested in, where you just have a personal interest? I really want to go taste this new type of food and how it impacts what you do with Kepio. <laughs> yes. Uh, we'll come back to that one because that's a really sort of interesting bit about tech in Asia. So I think it's probably a whole topic in itself. But yeah. in, in terms of like, the WeChat thing in particular, I think the, the bit that really blew my mind when I learned that you can renew your passport through WeChat. You know, yep. It's, a, it's wow. a government service where you can actually renew your passport directly on WeChat and they send you all the stuff mm-hmm. via that. That was when I realized just how powerful and integrated the WeChat platform is. It's, it's a unique to China thing. Um, obviously, the fact that Tencent, which is the sort of company behind both WeChat and all sorts of other amazing things that happen in tech in China. You know, they're, they're sort of very integrated with a lot of the, the day-to-day life stuff. So I think what's quite interesting is Tencent clearly see themselves as more than just a social company. They're thinking about the rest of the ecosystem, like payments and stuff too. So it, it's sort of a little bit startling, I think, when you look at the way that these things work elsewhere in the world, just how far ahead China is. Um, you've got some other really interesting platforms around the region. So you mentioned Line in Japan, which is obviously huge there. I think just about everybody in Japan seems to be using Line. Then you've got mm. Kakao in Korea, and mm. then you've got various other things around the region too. And I think it's it's really interesting how those build around culture. 
So the choice of platform in a given country is usually defined by a small group of people in the early stages of the adoption of all of these different platforms. And then it builds by word of mouth. So especially a messenger app, which is all about conversation, it's going to quickly grow when you meet people face to face and you say, are you on this platform? And then your friend says, no. And of course, you then have a discussion about what it is that person gets it and it grows exponentially like that. And it's really interesting. You go to somewhere like the Philippines and a platform like Viber exploded because you know, that was just the, the choice of platform of those select few influencers at the beginning. It's mushroomed out from there. So, yeah, I think it, it's, you, you've really got to understand those human to human, real life, face to face interactions before you can understand why the technological things took off. And I think it, that sort of leads into the second bit of your, your question, which is if you go out and you sort of see these little things in your own day to day life, you might be sitting having lunch somewhere and you notice that somebody's using a particular kind of device and it completely changes your perspective. So, Michael, I'd be, I'd be really interested if this is still the case. About a year ago, I was in Bangkok and I went to the it's not the floating market, but there's a sort of a series of st- street foodie kind of ideas, but they're on barges on the river. Yep. Um, and I went across there for breakfast one morning, and I noticed that there were a significant number of people there with larger tablet devices. So we're talking like iPads of the bigger variety. And they're using these things as phones, they're using them as cameras, but it was just the number of people that had those, which is something that I hadn't really seen anywhere else. Now, it might have just have been a peculiarity of that moment. But it's that kind of thing of suddenly realizing that the context for that particular audience in Bangkok is going to be completely different to the same sort of socioeconomic group in somewhere like Singapore, where they wouldn't be using a tablet device. I think it's that kind of thing that suddenly you go, shit, I'm going to have to completely change my idea of how I engage an audience in Thailand if that's the kind of devices that they're using because I can do richer experiences. They're clearly interested in a higher quality visual uh, experience and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, even very small moments like that. And you've got to be careful that you don't draw generalizations, obviously, from small interactions. But nonetheless, it sets up these important questions which you can then dig deeper into. Yeah, but I think you've pointed out something actually really important and something that's endemic to the way actually that the Internet or just, you know, mobile connectivity has or connectivity actually in, in Thailand. And I think for the most of developing Southeast Asia has has grown. And that is, you know, for you and I and for Graham, our exposure, our initial exposure, and I talk about this a lot to the Internet was on a desktop or on a laptop. Mm. Right. So if you extrapolate forward, you know, five years, if you and I had been using our technology on that barge, we would have had our laptop with us. Yeah, because that would have been the main way we like to type and and interact with data and the Internet. And yet in Southeast Asia, the reason why and not the only reason, but one of the reasons why, you know, big phones, big tablets and stuff are being used the way they are is because that is the only connectivity and also the initial connectivity that most Southeast Asians use to get to the Internet. And and I want to dovetail back to something you said earlier, but I will say this. What that means is that they don't need to bring, and I'm going to use air quotes, their laptop with them because they're they're always connected. Yeah. And you're right. What it, What it means is that their entire digital experience, and particularly from your viewpoint, right, where what is the social experience, what's the marketing experience, how do I PR to them, and what type of richness do they need? Because they're not going to close their clamshell laptop and put it away in a bag. They're going to carry it with them because that is their entire sort of connectivity and data existence. You hmm. said something You said something earlier, actually, in passing, and, and I want to bring it up again. You said WeChat is the internet in an app. And I just want to say that slowly again because it's really important. And the reason why, again, because you touched on it just now, is because most people's initial interaction with the Internet and with data in Southeast Asia is on a mobile device, right? And that means their entire experience is going to be different. But it also means that they don't know in some cases what the Internet really is. And if you ask them, and I've been talking about this for a few years now, if you ask them, are you on the Internet? they may actually say no. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Because because to them, the internet is like a Dell computer that sits under your desk with a big CRT monitor. (laughs) They don't have that. That's the internet for you guys. But if you ask them in reverse, like, are you on WeChat? Are you on Facebook? They'll look at you like you're crazy. Like, sure, but I'm not on that internet thing because that's, you know, for crazy people. How does yeah. that vary so, by region? Is, is that sort of a regional thing? I mean, Simon, you've been all over the place. Where is no, that no, no. more of the case? 
It's more the case where people's first interaction with the internet is on mobile. Right. And where where would that be, though? I mean, I'm asking Simon. Is that, you know, sorry. Where would that be? What sort of places where that was the sort of default where people are interacting with can, internet? I confess I've not been to Myanmar. It's a real right. sort of blight on my, uh, my travel plans. I really want to go. Um, but I've got friends who've been quite a lot, and I'm also speaking to people that are living there. And it, it's this idea that the internet is Facebook now that you start to stray into some political sort of sensitivities around that. And I'm going to avoid those very carefully. Yeah. But if you just take that from a sort of, from a business perspective, <clears throat> the idea that a lot of people in these sort of very fast emerging digital economies. So when you talk about Indonesia beyond the big cities, when you talk about sort of the rural areas of Thailand and Cambodia and Laos and these places <clears throat> where people increasingly do have, a smartphone. It may not be the latest iPhone for financial reasons, but the devices that they have are, you know, they're incredibly powerful, even by sort of five year ago standards on the iPhone. It's it's probably matching that, if not better. Um, and, you know, they have data plans which are not necessarily um, masses and masses of data. And yet it, they get free access to a platform like Facebook as part of their plan with their telco. And that then becomes the internet of everything. So I, through Facebook, can get access to all sorts of journalistic content. I can see videos. I can do all sorts of stuff. So for a lot of consumers, I hate that word, so a lot of normal people on the street, the internet becomes Facebook and maybe a chat app with it. But for a lot of businesses, especially for the smaller businesses, that is also the internet. So instead of spending time building a website and whatever else, even journalists, from what I can understand, are publishing direct to things like Facebook because that is where the majority of their audience is. And it's just one step too much to take them to another place. Why bother risking losing that audience if you can keep them there? So, yeah, and I think where you've got those sort of very rapidly developing economies around the region, and fortunately there are lots of those, you'll find that suddenly people have access to fairly sophisticated tech that they can put in their pockets for a reasonable amount of money. Um, I think that on that, uh, I think you know there, there will be people listening to this around the world. I had a really, really interesting um, conversation with a whole group of people from the US and the UK recently about um, two different posts that I put out. One of them was that there are now um, 5 billion people around the world using mobile devices and also the fact that India has just overtaken the US as the number one audience for Facebook. So all these people came back and they were like, oh, my goodness, you know, they can't even feed their own people, but they've got all these people wasting time on Facebook and stuff like that. And, you know, they can't afford food, but they're buying smartphones. Isn't it disgraceful what marketing wow. has done to people? There's this complete misunderstanding of the context. So for people in you know, the US and the UK and the rest of Europe, a smartphone is... It, you know, it's a luxury, if you like. It's where we play Candy Crush and chat with our friends about nonsense. You go to a market like India or you go to rural Cambodia, the smartphone is access to everything I need. I don't have a bank account, but I have access to finance on my device. I don't have access to a TV in some cases, but I can get the latest weather reports about my specific location to see that the crops need to be tended in the following ways because there's going to be sudden rainfall or there's going to be a dry patch and whatever else. So having access to a mobile phone is not about playing Candy Crush and chatting on no. a messenger. It's your banking. It's no everything you need to do business day to day. And, you know, even when you when you look at people that are unemployed in some of these places, you absolutely have to have a phone with connectivity in order to find temporary labor or a job of any kind. So I think yeah, there's an awfully sort of, there's a big misconception, if you like, as to what the internet means in the developing world. And I think it, it's very dangerous to bring in those cultural lenses that we bring from our own backgrounds. Yeah, and I would I would make the case as well, right, that actually people, there's food is abundant in India and Cambodia, right? It's an interesting concept that people have that that there's an overriding and sort of abiding poverty everywhere in the world. And if you have that, then maybe you shouldn't have access to a mobile phone. But I think what you're saying is, and I, and I agree with you, is that a mobile phone is like having electricity and running water. It's yeah. not a luxury. It's a necessity. It's how you live. And you talked like the micro banking is actually really important as well. Yeah. It allowed because it allows people actually, if they are impoverished, to take themselves out of poverty by connecting themselves to the global monetary system. Yeah. And the global economic system, that's super important for actually taking people from below the poverty line to above the poverty line. Yeah. I'm, I'm not pretending by any... I know. 
way that there's, there's not a lot of issues that need to be addressed yep. when it comes to poverty. But at the same time, a lot of the time, having access to a mobile device with an internet connection is the fastest route out of poverty for a lot of these people. So even just something as basic as being able to transfer mobile credit from one person to another as a means of payment for whether it's services rendered or whatever else, it, it's a fascinating sort of, you know, the, the ways that people find to transfer value between each other are not, it's not often the ways that sort of companies that set those platforms up, it's not what they intended. And yet, you know, you'll find all these incredibly entrepreneurial people all around Asia that have just sort of seized these opportunities and are creating a whole ecosystem around it which is helping them to achieve you know much greater progress and prosperity simon there's something i want to ask you about this because it seems that what you're doing is you're trying to tell a story about what actually is going on beyond the the superficial numbers i say superficial but the surface numbers the headline yeah. stats right and there's something that you published a while back which sort of caught my eye and it I guess it's so true because I've seen this happen in mobile as well. It says that you said that the data suggests there are more 18 year olds on Facebook <laughs> than there are 18 year olds on the earth. Right. And yes. I think of from my mobile days. I mean, we talked about mobile youth off the air, but there was a point at which, you know, okay, so all right, I get it. 120% mobile ownership in Finland. All right. What does that mean? <laughs> it stops meaning something, but yeah. you know what you're trying to do, you, you sort of, it's almost like, an ethnographic approach where you're sort of going to these places, you're learning, you're seeing what people are doing, you know, in the real world. And then you're trying to tell those stories to companies. But I always thought that was a bit of a challenge. You know, if you go to a, a Unilever or Google or a Coke, some of these great brands you've worked with is whether they get that or not, you know, they understand the figures. How, how do you sort of package those stories for them to understand that? Because that seems to be such a important part about what you do. Yeah, I confess the larger the company, the more difficult it is. Um, they've got fairly rigid structures and frameworks that they need to follow. And a lot of the time, you know, they have to have the data to back it up. That's one of the reasons I give all that data away for free. I kind of feel like if you don't have that, you can't even make basic decisions. And I think, you know, that data should be available to everybody so that they can make much higher value, more important decisions. But telling that story is it depends on how I'm, I'm, I'm straying into dangerous territory. So I'll Do try it. and choose my words. No, 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 no. This is what we're about. It's, it's, it's very easy for i'm gonna to have to say laziness to take over there there are a lot of marketers out there with far too much stuff to do but there are also marketers out there that want to take the easy option and i'm concerned by what i see when it comes down to we just want a nice 30 second video i don't know why we're still obsessed with 30 second videos for the internet it's like it's weird that we obsess about tv formats but we create these videos and we want it to be seen by as many people as possible and then you get into things like ad fraud and you get to viewability and then you get into whether or not the people that are seeing it actually care and trying to tell that story about anything beyond just the very basic demographic numbers is increasingly difficult because marketers either don't have the time or the inclination to pay attention to what really matters and yeah so i find increasingly i'm working Working with the sort of smaller, medium size brands who've got people that are really enthusiastic about the specific things that they're delivering. I'm not saying that obviously the multinationals aren't, but a lot of the marketing teams in those organizations are encouraged to sort of progress very rapidly from one brand to the next. And so they're more interested in the overall concept of marketing rather than falling in love with a particular brand that they're working on today. Um, and I think what's really interesting, I've been doing some work recently with a sort of a mid sized. Um, company who are really interested in digging into the deep, deep insights. So they they also touched on that there are more eighteen year olds using Facebook than there are eighteen year olds alive. Um, and it, it's it's once you get into that and once you start asking questions and it is the question of well how is that possible? And of course everybody immediately assumes that the answer is that uh, there's all sorts of ad fraud going on. But in reality, most of from what we can see based on you know obviously it's it's difficult to get real answers on this at a, a global scale. But the conversations I've been having. In Southeast Asia, for example, an awful lot of people just put in an age that they want to be. That, right. Does that mean exactly. that that data is then unreliable? And the answer that I would always go back to a marketer with is, which would you rather market to? The me that is the boring day-to-day, nine-to-five, or the me that I wish I was at the weekend, which is probably where I spend the majority of my disposable income? So if I'm trying to sell you 
consumer packaged goods like soap, then I'm guessing you probably want to speak to nine to five me. But if you're if you're selling me something a bit more aspirational, you probably want to be speaking to the bit inside me that still thinks I'm 18 and that still thinks I can go clubbing, even though the last time we went clubbing was years ago. And, you know, <laughs> the, the reality is that we portray a version of ourselves which reflects a lifestyle that we want to portray mm. not just in terms of the numbers we say we are to face, but also in what I wear when I'm walking down the street and the things that I spend my money on. So, you know, it may not be accurate, but at the same time, it still has a lot of value. And I think it's the stories behind those numbers that are always the valuable bits. Yeah. Um, getting that story out is incredibly difficult because obviously every single story is different. Different, right? Yeah, um, but that's, yeah. that's where the joy is. I, I, I find it fascinating that marketers don't want to dig into this because it's the bit that I enjoy most about this. Well, you, you mentioned but, the key word, didn't you? Laziness. Lazy. Yeah. Well, I, I, as I, I was going to say, hesitant, like, I'm going to get lots of hate. hate so, so I, mean, I did that for years. <laughs> I, I used to do marketing plans for telcos for 10, 12, nearly 15 years. And, you know, wow. Especially a telco that can come to a market like Asia where you can measure it in billions, right? Mm. So, you know, I got a lot of sticks. So, you know, I've got marks on my head that I bang my head against brick walls for many a day. <laughs> that's another story. It's not about me. It's about you. But it's, it, is, it is really interesting that you bring up this concept of laziness. And I think humans do tend to try to do the easiest possible thing. But they miss, they miss the, um, the forest for the trees here. And in the sense that you're doing that deep analysis. Right? And I loved one of the first things you said, which was, the numbers are great. You have to be very data oriented, but sometimes the numbers really require a looking over two or three times to understand what that backstory is that, that feeds them. And this 18 year old thing is the perfect example of that. Remember, Facebook also has a limit that says you can't join unless you're 13 and a bunch yeah. of 10 year olds are out there going, how old am I? And 18 to them sounds like 40. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so that's the first stage they pick. An eighteen-year-old is an adult who drives, who smokes and drinks, and that's who I want to be, and that's why they choose eighteen, maybe. But there are tons of reasons why. And again, you know, make another great point as well, which is, who do I want to be? Mm-hmm. Right, and that whole yeah. concept of because it's a balance, right? And I like I like this word balance, but there's a balance between who I really am, who I want to be, and how I can sort of balance between my aspirations and my reality. And yeah. that part of the story is fascinating for me as well. And that all hinges on empathy, which I think is one of the yeah. the, the most lacking elements of most marketing is that we, we've sort of come to this whole – the fact that we buy – space in media to interrupt people and stop them doing what they intended to do is a mm. complete demonstration of our lack of empathy as an industry but once you start to get into and you know we're talking about this podcast being about stories of people all marketing should be stories of people the more that you can relate to the individual obviously the easier it is to understand their needs and persuade them you think got to balance individuality versus the the mass reach you need to sustain a lot of these brands but you know, I, I still remember when i first started doing social media marketing um i was also doing a, a radio show a djing thing for it was for trance across the internet it was brilliant i loved it to death um and as part of that i met all of these kids all around the world that would sort of tune into the show each week and i would always make all my social media accounts you know very visible this is back in 2010 and i got all of these people from places like venezuela and egypt and indonesia and i still remember uh, there was this guy from rural Indonesia contacted me one Saturday morning on, remember when Facebook used to just have the chat thing as part of the bottom right hand corner, it would suddenly pop up yep. as a little messenger thing. Um, and he just, he contacted me one Saturday morning and he said, I'm in my field in some part of rural Indonesia planting broccoli and listening to your mix. And it just <laughs> blew my mind. I was like, That's this awesome. is absolutely insane. Now, I'm a kid that grew up in Edinburgh and it's really sort of <laughs> culturally sheltered existence. And here I am sitting in a nice sort of part of Singapore speaking to this kid who's out in a field who's listening to the same music that I love while he's planting broccoli. He's on his Blackberry device. He's very connected, even though he's a farmer. It was just like this realization that everybody is living a life which isn't he's a farmer. He is a trans fan who dreams of going and seeing Armin van Buren play into tens of thousands of people with lasers and stuff. And he's dreaming about it just happens to be that he's planting broccoli at that time. So it's, it goes back to that thing you were saying, Michael, about the sort of the difference between who we are and the dreams that we have. And right. ironically, there's a circularity to this. It brings me back to the, one of the reasons why I couldn't wait to move to Asia, which is just the genuine belief of everybody I met 
in terms of just like, you know, whether it's people that I met for work or just people on the street, this belief that tomorrow will absolutely be better than today. Yeah. You know, when you, when you spend time working with marketers in London, without any disrespect to any of them, but they tend to be a fairly cynical bunch. Right. And you know, there's, there's an awful lot of, oh, in my day, or there's an awful lot of, oh, that wouldn't work, and sucking of teeth. Whereas you come to Asia, and there's, the first question is, that sounds great, how do we make it work? Right. And I think this, that's, that's the thing that really inspires me about a lot of the audiences that we're dealing with here. And I think if, if you're going to be on an empathetic term with that audience, you kind of as a marketer need to embrace that and take that view as well of, you know, everything's going to be amazing. How do we help you get there faster? Mm. And I love that yeah, word I mean, for, as well, empathy. That's such a powerful yeah. word in marketing. So underrated, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Worryingly. No, it's good. I mean, there's a whole, you know, the, the whole Apple retail success story is based around, you know, there's a, there's a few key players involved in that. But if you look at what Apple retail did, I mean, Apple effectively is a retail company, right? I mean, 62% mm. of Apple's US employees work in the store. And if you have a look at the training manual, the training manual, I think there's, there's an article somewhere published in TechCrunch way back in the day. They went through the training manual and counted how many times the word empathy came up. In the training manual for, for the, you know, the genius crew who work in the Apple mm. stores, right? And it was, you know, you, you could count it in three digits. It was hundreds, right? This yeah. whole idea of empathy. And you, why was Apple successful? Well, a lot of it was empathy. They empathized with that grandmother who walked into the store and had a broken iPad, right? Yeah. But that's something, that's I don't know if you can teach that. That's the thing. I mean, it's something like you, you've come from a background where you started out in languages, right? So you're yeah. already curious about cultures from a young age, right? I think it's it's about exposure rather than about education, and that I know that the two of them are they're very similar. It's learning by experience rather than being taught it. But I think a lot, far too many marketers spend their time sitting in their offices reading research reports, and you know all they have to do is go down at lunchtime, put their phones in their pockets, and just look at their audiences. So some of the best insights that I get, and some of the best ideas that I've fortunately come across as a market that have been by just you know sitting on a train and watching people on the on the commute on the way to work in the morning if you're not watching what people are doing it's very difficult to understand what they want need and desire and no amount of research is going to help you to appreciate it even if it tells you the numbers so yeah i think it's just it's forcing forcing yourself forcing your colleagues to go out and actually spend time looking at these people and thinking about them as human beings, as not as consumers and not as just numbers on a page. But yeah, it, it does, it upsets me quite a lot that marketers don't have that desire to go out and do it. I'm guessing it's because they're too busy for the most part, but still, you know, the half an hour you spend reading that massive tome of research versus a half an hour you could just get going and wandering down the street. Sure, it's not going to be massively representative, but it's just as representative as any sort of focus group that you might run with eight people that tell you what they think in a very sort of artificial setting. Wow, that's so true. That's so true. We talked about this the other day, didn't we, Michael? Comfort zones and getting off your ass and a desk being a dangerous place from which to view the world. And we've both yeah, spent I mean, a bit of time stuck behind desks, right, in our life. A, a, yeah, I mean, for me, I think it would qualify as a little bit more than a bit of time. <laughs> 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 I actually refound my soul about two years ago. So yeah. <laughs> well, that's why we decided to go out and do this tour, isn't it? Because you know, to go and understand what's going on in the, the tech scene, in the startup scene in Asia, it's all very well. I mean, we could uh, you know read TechCrunch and read E Twenty Seven and all that kind of thing, but you just got to get out there and do this, right? You got to go to these places. And, yeah. Uh, and the comfort zone. It's not a choice. You, know, you can do both. And I think that's what's nice about a lot of what the Internet's given us is that we can now both stay in touch with all of the very carefully curated stuff and also then go out and look at what we see ourselves. And I think one of the other massively underrated bits of this whole sort of change is basic social listening. Everybody gets nervous when I talk about social listening because they think it involves million dollar tools and hardcore dashboards and stuff but in all honesty you know if, if i think about the social listening that i do both for my own business and for my clients i would reckon 90 percent of it is me scrolling through a feed whether it's on linkedin for a b2b client or on instagram for a cpg client and just putting in a hashtag so hashtag travel if you're anything if you're an airline if you're a hotel business any of that just looking at what people choose to take time out of their lives to share and then add that specific hashtag to you're going to get massive, massive 
insights and learning about what people care about. Absolutely. And I think you know, the, the, one of the best examples of this is Starbucks. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know the inside story. They haven't told me, but my interpretation is they used to spend a huge amount of money creating very sophisticated and actually very lovely content for their social media channels. But if you look at what the brand does on Instagram now, it is a reflection of what their audiences do. So if you put in hashtag, Insta, hashtag Instagram, hashtag Starbucks on Instagram, there is about 30 to 40 million people have posted with that hashtag. And the vast majority of those are people holding their their cup. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, you're holding it out in front of you, you've taken a picture with your phone of you standing with your Starbucks, and it's usually just a picture of the cup, it's not even a picture of your face. Around the world, every minute, a person posts a photo of their Starbucks cup, hashtag Starbucks on it. And I think Starbucks sort of realize, wait a minute, if that's what people are doing, and they think that's valuable, why don't we just do the same thing? So a lot of their social strategy now for Instagram, just mirrors that behavior, they create these beautiful shots of them holding their own Starbucks cups. I'm guessing it's cheaper than what they were doing right. before. But it's 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 They're a totally platform now, right? Rather than the content creators. They're curating yeah. this content. That's the goal, right? Well, they're, they're creating their own for it as well, so that they'll, they will take their own pictures of it too. But I think seeing your beloved brand doing that and knowing how easy it is for you to mirror it encourages you to do the same sort of thing. So instead of that sort of really painful upload your photo and tell us why you love us kind of approach that we used to have, Starbucks are just doing things that people can mirror really easily. And you know, a lot of the most sensible brands out there are doing that kind of thing. So anybody that's working with influencers has adopted that kind of strategy too. It's understanding that these are the people that really get their audiences and therefore working closely with them is the surest way to build some of that empathy that you maybe lack as a marketer. Right. And this is and this is sort of the connection as well between the offline and online. I think and I think if you ask most people, are you mirroring? I don't think they know what what it means but if you actually f listen to the things that they're saying when they're in conversations with either people that they do know or don't know mirroring itself actually ends up being a very powerful psychological tool to get people onto your side yeah i think you know in marketing you, you've got to carefully balance being a leader and being a part of the community as well obviously you, you do want to inspire people as well but a lot of the time being one of us you know that sort of maslow's hierarchy of needs when that sense of belonging brands need to play at all levels of that hierarchy as well. Uh, it's not always about aspiring to be at the top of the pyramid. Um, so, yeah, and I think that's, that's, that's a really important bit of the whole change that we need to go through is to, to realize that if we're going to be successful in social, it's not always going to be about us. That's not a social relationship, is it? That's a very no, egotistical no. relationship. Mm, yeah. but, um, it's very self-centered, yeah. I just wanted to pick up on one of the things you said as well, Michael. Um, this is meant in no way judgmentally, but it, no, tell it's me, this tell idea me. that as marketers, we're still making this massive distinction between online and offline. And yet, as soon as we stop being marketers, are you a different person when you pick up your mobile phone and start looking at something? It's, it's because we're making the distinction, we're holding ourselves back. Agreed. If, if you look at the way people use their... Um, their devices. So I've, I've just been doing quite a lot of digging into the top app choices for the different um, mobile stores around the world. And if you look at the top 100 free apps on App Annie, if you want to get that data, it's all available for free. You just need to create a free account. Um, it's fascinating. Like the, the top 100 apps, if you look across them in terms of categories, you've got the obvious things like communications and social networking, but you've also got dating, you've got finance, you've got health, you've, you've got every aspect of life. And from that perspective, you know, more than half of the world now uses the Internet, and that includes babies and people over the age of 100. And we're using our phones for just about every aspect of life. So let, let's stop pretending to ourselves that somehow online is different. It's an integrated part of everything we do in life. And as soon as we start treating it as life and not technology then we're going to make a, a massive sort of leap. I seem to be including the same slide in just about every presentation I've done recently, which is that psychology is more important than technology. And people sort of nod their heads, and then they immediately come back with questions about the technology. And it's like, forget the tech until you've understood the person. The tech doesn't really matter, because the tech is just a means to an end. Understand the psychology, be the empathetic marketer, and the rest of it all falls into place really quite quickly. And you've just synthesized the entire purpose for this podcast. <laughs> yeah. You have, though, in a way that's really beautiful, so and, that is, and that is don't think of it as technology. Think of it as life, right? In the same way that, again, electricity, your car, yeah. your washing machine, your dryer, your dishwasher. It, it, it's not like when you're you, – your life doesn't have like a specter where it's, okay, now you're using the dishwasher. Now you're not using the dishwasher. <laughs> you're a person. Yeah. It's like 
you are somebody and how do you use those things? This is the whole point is trying to figure out. And I used the word earlier and I use it on purpose, right? Blur. And there is – everything is blurring together. I use the concept of online to offline because too many people talk about it that way and they think about it that way. But you're right. The, the sooner a marketer or an e-commerce person or a business person is using technology to implement their business stops thinking about it as two separate realms is when they become much more successful because it's just shopping. Yeah. Right, totally. or it's just communicating, whatever it is. It's not online versus offline. It's just life, as you said. And I think that's a great um, synthesis of what we're actually trying to talk about here. So, Simon, just before we wrap up and ask you to share some links with us to t- so we can find out more about you, one question, cool. just finishing up, just on that subject of life, online, mm. offline, all mixed together, Singapore Whiskey Society. <laughs> we haven't talked about that yet. No. What's the story? Is there a whiskey society there? Is there a demand for whiskey? What's going on? I know you're obviously you're a Scot yeah. by birth and by upbringing, so whiskey's something close to your heart, I guess. Yeah, what's, 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 exactly. What's going on down there? Just share a little bit. Is it still active? Oh, totally. Yeah. So uh, we do regular events. Um, it, it's it's an appreciation rather than a, a marketing device. So it's for people to get together and. Basically, it's very similar to this, except it's got alcohol involved. So we get together and share stories. There's, there's inevitably a selection of whiskey that we enjoy, but that probably lasts about half an hour of these, sort of, these are the whiskeys and introduction, and then it just devolves into conversations about life. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, no, it started out as a, a just sort of, there are lots of people that said, oh, you're Scottish, tell me about whiskey. And it was just like, I realized that there was, everywhere you go in Asia, it's quite interesting. It's, like, it's a very Asian thing to enjoy whiskey. Yes. Um, but there was lots of people asking me what my favorite whiskey was and how do I enjoy whiskey? And it just sort of turned into a thing that I found I was doing ad hoc anyway. So I thought, well, I'll just turn it into a regular thing. So yeah, it, it's not intended to be a very sophisticated thing. It's definitely not a business, but it's a great way of meeting people that are enthusiastic about learning new things. And when people are interested in learning new things, they've always got loads of great stories to share as well. So it's my sneaky way of learning what else is going on in the world outside of marketing. Well, that's it's how you stuff. do it, right? What, what about Asian whiskeys? Are you a fan? Yes, definitely. So Japanese great. whiskey, um, massively, um, appreciative of Japanese whiskies. I'm actually going up to Tokyo in a couple of months. Um, mm. looking forward to that. So my wife's a big fan of sake. I'm a big fan of whiskey. So we'll inevitably be weaving a little bit of the, uh, the alcohols into our life up there as well. But yeah, no, Japanese whiskey is particularly, um, it's very, it's very sophisticated in mm. terms of the way that it's, it's made. It's quite different to Scotch whiskey once you get into the nuances of it, but yeah, I appreciate both of them in slightly different ways. Amazing. There's more to learn. We, we're just setting out on this journey. We've got to learn a bit more about Asian whiskey. So I only know a little bit, but I'm sure you can teach us all everything we need to know. Uh, Simon Kemp, everybody. He's the go-to guy when it comes to Asia digital marketing. Simon, where do we find out more about you? Uh, the easiest place to start will probably be LinkedIn. Um, so if you just search for Simon Kemp, hopefully you'll find me. Black and white photo, me with specs. Um, if you want to dig a bit deeper into the content, then kepios.com. So K E P I O S dot com, um, and yeah, if you've got any questions, then I'm always on social. So feel free to send me your questions, your provocations, your challenges. Fantastic, Simon. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for all your insights into Asia and life in general. We look forward to finding out more about you. We'll put all those details in the show notes as well, and also come back on the show in future. We'd love to hear about your adventures and your journeys in Asia and what you've learned. Definitely. I'd love to. Thanks for having me today. And uh, yeah, look forward to being back next time. Simon, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.